Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. And today I have as my guest, Dr. Bryce Hayden. Uh, Dr. Hayden is a doctor of physical therapy and uh, has extra certification in orthopedics. Um, thanks for joining us, Bryce. Well, first of all, I'd like, to, I'd like to understand a little bit more. You had mentioned as we were talking before this interview that you actually have an extra certification in, in some type of orthopedic specialty within physical therapy. Can you explain that to me and, and how you go about getting that? Sure. Um, so all physical therapists take a national board exam that essentially gives them their, their physical therapy license. And then after you've been practicing for a while, many people kind of take a, a specialty route and one way of kind of showing that you've met this specialty and, and it's a, a higher degree within the um, area, you, you hone in on one specific area and I took mine in orthopedics um, three years ago or so. It's a, it's a board exam that says you have reached a competency level and you've practiced for at least five years and you've had X amount of hours in this specialty area. And so yeah, mine's in orthopedics and which is a, a broad field of joint related things from the ankle to the temporal mandibular joint. So. Okay. Well, I thought, I thought what we would do today is, is really talk about an, a very common orthopedic problem, and that is the, the problem with ankle sprains and ankle instability. And I, what I'd really like to do is focus on how you as a physical therapist begin to address uh, these problems in patients who present to your practice, either referred from uh, another uh, orthopedic specialist, such as an orthopedic surgeon or a regular family physician, or maybe if they just show up in your office with an ankle problem. How do you begin to assess patients in terms of their ankle function? Uh, I guess the, the, the biggest approach I take first off is, is this the first time around? Because, uh, you know, the, the chances of ankle sprains is, I think it's the highest sprain joint on the human body just because it is the, you know, the lowest joint and we're, we're just naturally meant to have mobile ankles and in the same side of the coin of, of mobility, uh, joint is that it is prone to being sprained and the the typical uh, inversion sprain is is quite common so what I look at is uh, the severity of it and we kind of have a few different ways of grading the severity of a sprain and if this is a repeated issue where it goes away for a while and then they sprain it again and I, that kind of sets the bar with how much we're going to need to put into stabilizing it and looking a bit maybe initially at just protecting the joint with a, uh, the initial traumatic sprain and then really working on getting the inflammation down and getting them comfortably walking again. And then a lot of the rehabilitation component is, is kind of building the strength back around the joint and also working on their balance and what we call proprioception and kind of how they f position themselves on that joint to make it a more stable, workable joint so it's not a repeated issue. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you, you mentioned something um, that I think we probably ought to clarify the term, and that's inversion sprain. Mm -hmm. And for you and I, I think that, that we throw these terms around, eversion and inversion. Um, the typical sprain with an inversion is, is when the outside of the foot actually rolls under. So the patient tends to roll onto the outside of the foot. And that's, as you mentioned, that's by far more common than the opposite. Mm -hmm. Because if you really sit down and try to sprain your ankle in that way, it's very difficult to yeah. do. It's very easy to do uh, with an inversion sprain. But I, I think we do see eversion injuries. Uh, unfortunately, they generally end up in fractures rather than sprains. So, right. uh, so that motion tends to, to put a lot more force on the, uh, the lateral uh, malleolus or the fibula and can definitely lead to, to a fracture. Mm -hmm. But for, for patients that may not understand that term, I think that probably clarifies it. Um, when you see these patients, I mean, what are they complaining of? When you see them in the, in the office, are they coming in complaining that they have weak ankles or are they coming in complaining about pain? Uh, well, kind of both. It, you know, the kind of divvying them into two parts is there. there's the the person with the real acute sprain that you know was on a trail run or something and hit a rock wrong and you know it really rolled in the ankle and they, their whole body weight kind of came down on it. Sometimes there's an audible pop, they tear a ligament, and that that's a typical one that you'll see bruising and swelling and they're you know limping on the leg and it's really hard for them to put weight on and in that initial phase they they usually have a fairly stiff ankle which you know, is the body's natural mechanism to kind of protect that the other stream we see is people with you know really mobile ankle joints that you know they could step on a, a penny you know on the sidewalk and you know tweak their ankle and and on that and we look a lot more at is there a, a lot of 
excessive motion on those ones where we're not treating maybe the more acute end of it where we're working on getting the inflammation and the bruising reduced and getting the mobility working again, but what can we do to get them some better stability around that ankle joint so when they do step on the odd crack wrong or you know, uh, transition in their carpet that they're not you know, constantly falling on this uh, really wobbly joint. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think you pointed out a, an interesting point and a, and a very important point, and that is that these really are two different injuries. You know, we're really talking about the person who's had maybe that first or second bad ankle sprain. They have somewhat of a different problem than the people who have what we would consider chronic instability or probably left over from having two or three of these bad sprains, and now those ligaments have not gone on to heal appropriately. They probably have not been fixed surgically, and their problem is a little bit different. Let's go back to that acute injury, because I think a lot of folks have had, probably all of us, quite frankly, have yeah. had at least one ankle sprain. So, you know, it's three days later after that bad ankle sprain. As you mentioned, my ankle's swollen. It's probably bruised. It's sore. I don't want to walk on it. I'm probably on crutches. I show up in your office. How are you going to deal with that? So, you know, the, the initial first week or two after this injury, we, we kind of manage the, the, the typical acute injury with, you know, getting them to get some motion back in it in a comfortable position. So we have a lot, doing a lot of things with reduced weight bearing, trying to get them some natural glide on the ankle joint, maybe riding a bicycle or doing some ankle pump type motions or hopefully both, but ways that they can keep their general fitness up, get a lot of circulation around that, turn over that inflammatory process and see if we can kind of chase out the inflammatory soup that's collected around it. Um, We'll sometimes manually get in there a little bit, see if we can't push out some of that um, edema or fluid sitting in their ankle. We'll also get on there and see if we can't manually get the joint working a little better so we can kind of smooth out what's sometimes a mechanically sticky joint. Um, then they get them doing just some real gentle strengthening. You know, the thought is, is while you can in this kind of acute early phase of a big ankle sprain, what can we do to kind of optimize them getting back on their feet sooner and uh, make it as hopefully pain reduced as possible. And sometimes we'll get them a crutch or some kind of walking stick so they're not really limping on this leg and throwing off their hip and their back and causing some other problems up the chain. Yeah, you know, I think, I think you point out an interesting point, and that is, you know, 20 years ago, there was, uh, there was a, a big move towards um, immobilizing these, these ankle injuries, hoping that that was going to allow those ligaments to heal to the point to where um, they wouldn't, wouldn't, it wouldn't turn into a situation with chronic ankle instability. And I think what you're describing is a much different sort of uh, approach. We don't put people in cast usually. Mm-hmm. We might brace them, but we try to get them moving and weight bearing as soon as possible. And, and that's been a major shift, I think, over the last two decades. Um, it, it sounds like from what you've just described that, that just because that ankle is painful and swollen, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to allow that patient to sort of just sit with the ankle, uh, you know, up to try to control the swelling. You're going to get them moving and get that motion back immediately. Is that accurate? Yeah, I I think, you know, at some point the the old adage of bed rest, get off it, get it elevated, is, is kind of now been looked at with longer outcome studies that actually the sooner they get it moving in a comfortable fashion and we wouldn't have them, you know, back running on it or doing anything where they're really pounding on a sore joint. But yeah, they're going to be feeling better sooner and hopefully getting back to what they like to do, whether it's hiking or biking or just walking between the kitchen and the, the bedroom. You know, just, just getting them comfortably moving on it in a safe fashion is kind of our, our initial order of business. Now, with that acute injury that, that we've just been discussing, how long do you usually anticipate that it's going to take for that patient to get through this process and get to the point where I would say that they can consider this injury behind them? healed and they're pretty much doing whatever they want to. You know, and, and the, what's interesting about that is, is that there's many people who have multiple acute ones, like you said, they're kind of the, the revolving door. Well, it, they'll sprain it one year and it'll come back. But on, on a typical one, you know, the, the really agonizing phase of the injuries is usually behind them by about, you know, between two to four weeks. The swelling's largely better, the motion's getting better, um, and they can be 
you know, walking and jogging fairly comfortable. The, the remaining problem is they'll, after they really stretch this ligament or the lateral kind of ankle complex, it, it still feels unstable on them and they're just not sure of stepping off curbs or walking in low lit situations or out on a, a grassy field where they, they really feel the, the, the stability piece is still missing. So, you know, to get them to where it's actually feeling like a comfortable ankle. I usually say give yourself two to four weeks if you're really sticking to it, but people say, when will the swelling look better? And after a big ankle sprain, sometimes it takes six months, nine months, a year to really have you know, the same shape of ankle as the, the opposite side just because it's, it's a long ways from the heart, fluid stays in there, and people will often still have kind of a stiff, swollen ankle sometimes months after the injury. Well, let's move on and talk a little bit about what, what you and I don't like to see, and that is for these acute ankle injuries to turn into what's a chronic problem because, as you mentioned, that ankle is just not as tight. It has too much mobility. The ligaments are not doing what, what they should be doing, and, and the patient is beginning to have symptoms. How does that patient differ when you see them in terms of their presentation from that acute ankle sprain? Uh, it- the, the, the typical problem we'll see is that you know, they'll, they'll have the, the big you know, initial trauma and then they'll, they'll have just a kind of a floppy ankle and you know, they're, they're feeling limited in really what they can do as far as you know, to say street jogging would feel comfortable but once they get onto some grass or something um, or a, you know, the Kim Williams trail, something that's kind of rocky, um, they, they, they really will struggle with feeling it supportive and they'll just kind of re- Repeatedly, you know, normally the the joint once it's it's back, you'll have this kind of quick reaction. If you you know humans naturally step, and when we land on the outside of our foot, just with the typical strike and rolling forward onto our towards our toes, you know, we'll we'll have that ability. If there's little shifts in the surface, we'll you know quickly rebound. The problem with a, a kind of a devastating or a large ankle sprain is is that the the quick rebound of getting you back into this, this plane of motion is delayed a bit, and that's often when it goes from, you know, you're stepping on it a little funny, and then next thing you're, you're fully rolling it, and the, the quick response is delayed, and so getting these people recognizing this limitation and then working on some ankle stability exercises to kind of throw you into the, the limits of where you feel stable and getting them to make the little micro adjustments to get back on the, the foot in a supported manner. Now you mentioned proprioceptive training. Is that what we're talking about here? Is that is that the cause of this lack of ability to respond in the same way that a normal person was? Is that all about proprioception? Yeah, it's it's proprioception's happening all the time. This kind of feedback loop. But the the thought it would be that after you've had a big injury, there's going to be delays in it. The the little fibers that normally get stretched and give you a. a, a feedback loop to say this is where the ligament is, this is where the joint is in space, are because the ligament gets stretched or possibly torn, we don't have the same crisp little neuromuscular circuit. And so, yeah, some of, some of that is, is some proprioceptive reduction and some of it is that the ligaments just aren't as stiff and so when you roll into it a bit, they're going to give you a little bit more and then we're problematic when we're outside that kind of comfortable bound. You know, I think we probably ought to explain the whole concept of proprioception and, and why we lose it in, in joint injuries. And as I understand it, that what we're really talking about, or the thought process, is that there are nerve endings in all of our ligaments that tend to send signals back to the brain that, as you said, tell us where that body is. So when I close my eyes, the reason I know where my hand is, is, is this proprioceptive feedback. And when you tear a, a, a ligament, you've actually torn those nerve fibers. There may be, it may be more complex than that, but, but essentially you can think of it in terms of, of damaged nerves that need to grow back and be retrained. So I'm assuming that, 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 that what you're explaining is, is the same thing that I'm explaining, that we're waiting for those nerves to grow back, and then the physical therapy, the training, is actually designed to teach those nerves how to actually give us the right information that's usable information. Correct, yep, and, and so like anything, you, you start at a real gradual level of saying how do you feel on a flat surface, doing some things that kind of challenge you, balancing on that, that one leg, and then climb the ladder up 
kind of with successive approximations to things that really challenge you outside that balance and can your ankle and those nerve endings that are sensing how far you're being stretched and how far you're, you're, you're pushing it, can they bring you back to kind of what we think of as a more of a neutral stable position. So yeah, the proprioceptive or I like to call it dynamic balance training where we're, we're not just standing in one place but we're trying to kind of mimic human motions that do throw our balance off a little bit and, and have people practicing things at home and working on kind of challenging their limits of stability. Now, like the acute, the, the acute injury where we talked a little bit about the time frame when we're thinking that, you know, finally that ankle is going to start, uh, the swelling is going to go down, the ankle is going to start feeling like a relatively normal ankle. When you see a patient with chronic instability, you may have been putting up the, w with this for years, mm -hmm. you begin a physical therapy program, how long should that person expect to be working with a physical therapist before they plateau off and sort of have gotten all the benefit out of those exercises? Well, uh, you know, it, it, re it really is going to vary on the person. I think this day and age with how expensive healthcare is, and some people just need, you know, a couple appointments and say, take it and work with it. And other people where it's, it's more limiting to their, their lifestyle or they have some other mechanical issues going on, you know, we'll spend, you know, I, I tell people, expect it, let's look at it for a couple weeks. We usually say, but around four weeks, if, especially if we're just looking at someone who's had more of a long history of ankle instability. Um, and if, if it's just pure stability training, I'll say, let's look at it for four weeks or so, kind of uh, t say twice a week, a little more um, on the the thorough end in the beginning and then we kind of taper into more what they're going to be doing at home because you know that at, at this point the, the ankle's still going to have the available motion and we're not necessarily snugging the joint tighter but we're getting them to really challenge what they can comfortably do and then keep trying to up the ante of what the ankle will allow comfortably and get them to rebound so in that phase we would you know see them on a less frequent basis, maybe once a week to every two weeks, and then, you know, as necessary. So, but they're still going to be practicing this at, for their own ability. Um, you know, I, I try to kind of build it into a leg strength program and say part of your program is going to be the neuromuscular and getting this little nerve feedback loop strong. And as we age, you know, this, this does uh, reduce. So, getting people aware that just as important as working your ankle strength and getting the muscles and tendons to, to work strongly again, we need to have a, a balanced stability component. And athletes and just the common um, non-athlete still will be working on this for, you know, years. So, so it's, it's not something that ever really ends. What you're saying is that, that if you have a chronic unstable ankle that, you know, if you don't get surgery on it and, and have it stabilized, these exercises need, it's like training, you need to continue to train and continue these exercises. Right, I build it into their program and you know you mentioned earlier that people will brace it so if they're going to be out doing a sport like basketball or soccer where they're going to be cutting on it and there's a lot of unexpected things where other people are jumping or sliding in front of them, you know sometimes we'll say you need to brace it kind of like turning the four-wheel drive on your car. You know, if you have sprained your ankle for the past decade multiple times a year and we, we, we need to look into what can we do to give it some additional external support during these kind of rigorous activities um, on top of what they're going to be doing to maintain their strength and maintain their kind of dynamic balance and stability on it. Well, I'm glad you mentioned bracing because I do think that patients are always asking questions about several different things. One is braces. You know, what's the best brace? What should I wear? Should I wear a brace? I mean, a lot of them have this notion that if they wear a brace, the ankle will become weak, so they'll become dependent on it. The other thing I find patients ask is about orthotics. You know, is there a special orthotic that I can put in my shoe that might reduce the risk of instability? And finally, shoe wear. I think all patients sort of have some notion about what type of shoe wear is best for them, high top versus low top, depending on their activity, tennis shoes, hiking boots, or what. I guess of all those three things, braces, orthotics, and shoe wear, do you have any recommendations for patients? Um, well, like you mentioned, uh, the going just to a brace sometimes is kind of dodging the, the issue of saying, I have indeed an ankle problem. And when I brace it, my ankle feels more supported. But am I doing my joint any favors by 
bracing the joint and not really having the strengthening component and the balance component. So yes, bracing is an effective way at supporting the ankle, but also you, if, if you're not having the kind of supplementary exercise program and doing some things to support it, your ankle is, is kind of being short change the, the stability component that it needs to be working on because hopefully you wouldn't be just wearing the brace around the uh, clock. I think we'd be doing a big disservice to people if we just said take the brace and run and, and wear it when you feel like you need it. But the brace is, is definitely something that is a, a good piece of helping support the ankle, especially during activities. And maybe right after a big ankle sprain, you would be bracing it for just typically walking around the street while the, the ankle is being resupported. So yes, bracing is, is a, a real effective. I, I like you know these kind of snug braces that have this little Velcro figure eight support that kind of mimic some of the, the crossovers of the, the ligaments. So they're pretty low profile, not a big thick brace, but often they're just giving it a little bit more compression around the joint and then people can kind of support Support it with the little uh, Velcro clasp. Um, as far as orthotics go, it's it's dipping into a, a huge pool of, of what are you essentially changing in their gait mechanics for do you need an orthotic? And, and humans naturally do have the tendency of, of striking on a bit of the outside of their foot. So that's why we see more of these, these uh, lateral ankle sprains where they're rolling. Um, or sorry, inversion where they're rolling the outside of their, their ankle joint. So sometimes um, you, you can make some small adjustments in, with um, putting an orthotic in there, but usually it's, it's a little more complicated than that. And there's a, some other things we're changing if we're, we're throwing an orthotic in the shoe. So um, there, there can be some improvements with that, but also you're often putting the person up a little higher and by raising the heel counter up, we're also throwing you into a little bit more of a realm of possibly changing your balance and by ha having your foot higher off the ground, you know, often people notice when they have a running shoe or something like that with a really high cushiony heel that they're much more prone to sprain it. And, and what about shoe wear? You mentioned the, the shoes with a higher heel or platform shoes or anything always put you at, at a higher risk if you have unstable uh, injuries or unstable ankles. But do you really believe that there's any benefit to having uh, for example, tennis shoes that are high top versus low top. Is there any benefit to going to a high top tennis shoe? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the in, initial reason I think people wore the canvas uh, high tops for, for basketball is that you want that ankle support for uh, a dynamic sport that you're cutting and you're running and you're, you're moving sideways a lot and you're coming down on it so, um, from jumping. and. Um, I, I think that high tops do have their, their, their place and you know if you're backpacking and you have a backpack on and you're walking over um, unstable rocks, having shoes that do cross the ankle joint and kind of help support the ligaments are, are a smart idea, especially if you've sprained your ankle um, multiple times or have a history of that and you, you're thinking you're three days into the wilderness, sometimes it's good insurance to have something that crosses the ankle and, and helps support you. and. Um, your ankle stability from the outside. So footwear, footwear is important and I, uh, you know, I think people will sometimes initially right after an injury get in, into wearing something that's more supportive that if they're not bracing it, um, like a, a high top because uh, running shoes and clogs and these kind of things, even flip flops can <laughs> be quite challenging on uh, getting the ankle supported again. Well, this has been a fascinating, I think, comprehensive discussion about ankle sprains and ankle instability and, and really the physical therapy approach to, the, to, to those two disease processes. Is there anything you can think of that you would like patients to know that we haven't discussed during this interview? You know, I, I, I guess the, the common ankle sprain, like immediately, what do I do and do I need to see a physical therapist? Because, you know, many people, can, can walk away from an ankle sprain or all have done it 10 times and kind of from the, the expert look at what do I need to do and when do I need to see a physical therapist for this. And I, I tell people kind of the drawing line of is this something that's repeatedly happening and if it's severe enough that they could have, like you mentioned before, fractured something or fully torn something, is it, do I need to get in and see an orthopedic specialist, um, physician or physical therapist? And kind of that, that line in the sand I, I tell people is, is it getting better on its own? You know, in, in the first couple days, do you find that it's gradually getting better? And if it's something that's so severe that you might have fractured it or fully torn it, 
yes, you do need to get emergent medical care on that because if you can't weight bear comfortably on your ankle, um, there's, there's probably something significant on there. And getting it checked out, whether you get a, in to see a physical therapist and then the physical therapist needs to make sure you follow up with more emergent medicine, getting in and seeing an um, orthopedic physician for some kind of x-rays or, or more support on that. So when to get in, if you can weight bear comfortably and walk on it, um, that's usually a good sign. But if it's something that's repeatedly happening, it's definitely worthwhile getting in and, and seeing a physical therapist to kind of help you follow up with reducing that same ankle sprain in the future. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and, and giving us this wonderful information. So thank you very much. Well, thank you.